Welcome back to another new podcast from Codings Pro Magazine. As always, I'm your host, Ben Duvos, news editor with the AMP Publications team. Today, as we continue our member profile series, we're joined by Michael Beamish, vice president and general manager of Defelsco. Defelsco is based in Ogdensburg, New York, a manufacturer of paint test instruments that are sold all across the globe. And as for Mike, he's got degrees in mechanical engineering and law with experience in design, production, and marketing those instruments in all sorts of international industries, including industrial painting, quality inspection, and manufacturing. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time. How are you? I'm great, Ben. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I should also mention off the top that Mike is a member of our editorial advisory board at Codings Pro, or editorial advisory group, excuse me, that we call it the EAG. So we'll be touching on that when we delve into some of the association aspects of the member profile, because that's something that over the past year in particular, he's really helped us out a lot at Codings Pro, and so we are going to dive into that as we work our way through this member profile. But I want to start off by letting you introduce yourself on a deeper level to our audience. I gave some of the highlights, but just explain beyond what you're doing now, what has your career been like in the industry? How did you get started? How did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? And how did your career path evolve to where, again, you're now the VP and general manager? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a it's a somewhat difficult one to answer because depending on how you look at it, I either got involved about eight years ago or I got involved about thirty years ago. <laughs> um, my uh, my grandfather founded this company back right. in 1965, and my parents joined it in the late 80s, uh, right around when I was born, actually, within a year of my birth. So I spent. Uh, a good part of my age two to four in a crib in the back room of the, the warehouse of our, <laughs> one of our original buildings. And so you know, from then on, this company has been part of my blood. You know, every dinner time was often a bit of a business uh, discussion between my parents about how the business was going. So almost by osmosis, I learned a little bit about the business every day and about the industry. And so as I grew up, if I had a holiday or something like that, I would want to come into work. I would do uh, some of the, the more entry level tasks, like creating those little books of shims that come with a, a coating thickness gauge, packing those in little packets, uh, opening bags for materials, etc. And from then on, I my love for the industry and the business grew. I actually, I believe, my first uh, industry trade show was NACE. 2006, San Diego, I believe. Uh, I think that was the first year that I think at age 14 or so, uh, I was actually allowed to be in the exhibition hall. And alongside my father, we we ran the booth together. And that was my first real introduction to the, the people in the industry and being able to interact. And amazingly enough, a lot of the people I met back then are still in this industry and, and still people I get to see when I go to conferences, when I'm on calls, et cetera although there are also a lot of great new faces. And from there, I, I did spend quite a few summers working here and at a few other internships because, of course, it was always important to my family that mm -hmm. this was not something that I was forced into or required to do, but it's something I genuinely wanted to do. So I was uh, really had the good fortune of uh, getting some experience at Procter & Gamble while I was uh, doing my mechanical engineering degree. I spent some time at a patent law firm while I was doing my law degree. But ultimately, uh, you know, the, the choice was pretty clear. I, I love this business down to the core and I, I wanted to come back to it as soon as I, I graduated from law. And that was tough to believe, I think, almost nine years ago uh, this month. And so here I sit today. And, uh, you know, it's it started in my full-time career. The first thing I did was uh, was in charge of the expansion of our, our facility here, which uh, mm. is now, I think, it, it grew three times the size at that point. And, uh, and because everything we do is in this facility here in Ogdensburg, from research and development, manufacturing, sales support, uh, marketing, et cetera. And then from there, you know, that gave me a really good opportunity to meet everybody at all corners of the business. And I developed my career from there, uh, taking on more and more, getting heavily involved in the marketing side of the business, as well as the research and development uh, side of the business, because I'm, I'm in my background and my true passion is science. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, as I work closer with my parents and unfortunately due to my father's passing several years ago, 
I was you know, very quickly elevated and had, uh, you know, really a, an unfortunate but incredible opportunity to take uh, the, the vice president and general manager role as of, uh, I guess, four years ago now. So you were truly born into this, you might say. <laughs> I don't know how one could be more born into anything. Right. I am born into this. Yeah. Right. All right, so tell us a little bit about the company and its evolution over that time. I know what you do now is a little different than when your grandfather started the company in 1965, correct? Yes. At the time when he first started the business, it was certainly not in the, at the same scale. And right. as a, you know, as a really an entrepreneur starting his own business, he had several different uh, directions that the business could be taken in. I, up until I think the nineties, he actually had a business selling these very innovative, uh, metered liquor pours, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But alongside all that, he made the first steps into the, the coding inspection uh, realm. Of course, that was when this industry was in a different, very different place, when quality was, you know, not taking measurements and reporting results, but just making sure something looked vaguely right. Uh, so it was a very small industry back then. But he stuck with it. He, he, I think, really enjoyed the both the people and just the general dynamic of, of quality inspection. And uh, over the decades got into, you know, made really great partnerships with distributors all across the world and slowly grew the product line, uh, you know, embraced electronics when they came out. And so from, you know, then on, it really was organic growth, uh, slowly expanding the product line, uh, really being at the forefront of technology. My grandfather, even though his background was tool and die machining, uh, where he was trained back in the, I guess it would have been, 30s and 40s mm-hmm. um, and but he really he had a real passion for technology even though he frankly didn't always understand it and so he was very you know he really placed a lot of value on having a really uh, powerful research and development department releasing new products products etc and really you know although maybe the uh, the wallpapers changed and the building looks a little bit bigger and different now we haven't departed much from that core ethos that my grandfather started he was the first one that started donating instruments to NACE because he really believed in training and educating people on how to use the products that's something he was passionate about for decades and we've really just continued that that uh, that direction so let's talk about specifically your time which is about 9 years right Yeah. Your time in the formal roles, let's say, because I know you go back informally a bit longer than that. How has the inspection industry, which you all specialize in as far as supplying tools and technologies to address many of the concerns that coatings professionals may have out in the field, how has the inspection industry changed over the last decade or so? What are some of the market trends that you all are adjusting to right now because of course i know as a developer you guys want to make sure you're on top of what's going on out in the field so that you can develop products and services accordingly that work for what the challenges are what are some of the trends that you're seeing in 2023 that you weren't in the early 2010s when you were first getting started i think at the macro level what i see is that you know, the the people who maybe were starting to get into digital inspection back then are now much more advanced. Now they have equipment that is reporting back to the cloud, networked with one another, really embracing, you know, the cradle to completion or cradle to report method of reporting where the data is all digital, starts on the gauge when a measurement is taken, is either uploaded to the cloud via Wi-Fi or connected to a computer where their reports created, et cetera. And at the same time, the people who either weren't measuring or were just starting to get into digital gauges or maybe were using mechanical gauges at the time, now they are moving into digital gauges and just starting to get to the reporting. So, you know, from a, a macro perspective, overall in the inspection industry, the biggest trend is reporting and digitization by far. Even though 2014, 20, you know, the early 2010s, you'd think that a lot of people were, mm-hmm. were doing that. It was amazing, and you know, to be frank, is still amazing today how much happens on pen and paper because especially yeah. in an industry where reporting, where documentation is so critical, it's not something that can change quickly or on a dime. 
And what we see is that the industry is cautious. They wait until they are convinced and that something is proven, and then they rapidly uh, rapidly take it on. And that's really what we saw in the latter half of the, the 2010s. On a micro perspective, as far as individual product lines and that sort of thing, I think we've seen a, a really close focus on surface preparation. I think, you know, through my own research uh, via papers at AMP, and with a lot of you know, reviewing a lot of research from others at various conferences, I think it's become clear that there is more than just making sure it isn't, you know, too dusty and the peak height in a surface profile, a blasted surface profile is sufficient. Now it's about measuring salt concentration. It's about going beyond peak height, about peak density and surface morphology, that sort of thing. There's a keen awareness in the industry that we don't know everything. There are still somewhat mysterious coding failures that don't have a clear cause, that it appears from the documentation that everything's been done correctly, but something happened with the coding. And so I think we're still on the cusp of that. I think it's still in process, but the surface prep certainly has matured a lot, but in my opinion, is still maturing. I think we'll continue to see innovative technologies and processes uh, as as the research kind of clarifies and uh, becomes a little clearer. Yeah. Yeah. To your point on the digital side, I had a podcast a few weeks ago with one of the digital folks at PPG, and of course, they talk about it from a manufacturing standpoint as a paints and coatings manufacturer. But, yeah, they introduced their new app for ordering purposes in 2022. And what she was saying, and if you want to listen, it's in our archives at the Coatings Pro interview series. Listen on your podcast provider of choice. What she was saying is that it really wasn't until 2020 in the pandemic that everyone in the industry truly embraced the digital side and what – that has to offer in terms of really transforming this industry that before that, certainly the technologies were out there in the early 2010s when you got started on a formal level with Defelsco, but really it hasn't been until this decade with the onset of the pandemic that really forced everyone into the deep end. And so I think, you know, we're still in the relatively early stages of what I would call truly widespread adoption. And so I think your point on that is well taken as far as surface prep, Look, your instruments, certainly they can assist contractors with making sure that they perform the surface prep correctly. They can also, the, the instruments that is, be useful in terms of measuring a coding application and making sure that goes to spec. What are some of the common pitfalls or questions that you hear about when you talk to an applicator or a prep specialist these days. Just talk about the feedback that you hear as far as their challenges, what they need, and then how some of your instruments can potentially help contractors avoid or overcome those issues. It's an excellent question. I think it it does often run the gamut, but some of the common things I often hear is first an, a lot of confusion both by the specification writers and by those who are implementing the specification about the proper tests to be using and the proper means to, to conduct those tests, especially because in surface prep, there are often many solutions that somewhat solve the same problem. For example, mm-hmm. when measuring profile, you can use a comparator, you can use a depth micrometer gauge, you can use test X replica tape, or you can use a, a drag stylus meter. And they don't all work exactly the same, and they don't necessarily give the same result. And so that can be confusing when somebody specifies, say, ASTM D4417, which is the mm-hmm. surface profile standard, which one they should be using and how they can interpret the results. And that's something as a manufacturer, we put a lot of effort into training and and try and explain what the differences are through our own videos and our own articles, et cetera. Another example that is with salts, especially salts on the survey. That's a very, really kind of confusing topic, especially because a lot of the information that's been disseminated isn't necessarily science-based. There's a lot of conjecture out there, Mm -hmm. not a whole lot of science to back it up whether you have to test for specific ions, whether you measure total salts using something like a Bresley method. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the science isn't out there to answer those questions perfectly. So I can only offer my own experience and conjecture of my own. Mm -hmm. It's why our company tries to do at least one or two scientific studies at the the AMP presentations every year, and we'll be having, I think, at least two coming up. 
uh, is to try and answer some of those questions. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, that's, that's often the greatest challenge is just clarity about what the right best practice is, especially trying to break through a lot of the marketing hype. I know another part of the challenge for, I suppose, both you all and especially contractors that are using your equipment is making sure that you stay in dialogue because, honestly, a tool is only going to work as well as the user of it understands how it's supposed to be done. So I know service is a big component for a company such as yours. How accessible are you guys to contractors in the field, and how important is, I suppose you'd call it a technical service relationship between an applicator or a prep specialist and an instrumentation provider? Just talk about the ways in which you work with some of your end users to make sure that they are using those tools correctly. It's a great question, Ben, because we don't want to just sell an instrument and right. have a customer that doesn't end up using it correctly. That, that right. brings us into disrepute. It brings the industry in disrepute, and it can obviously cause safety challenges and stuff like that. So I think the first means by which we accomplish that is to just try and make our instruments and our literature and our instruction manuals as simple and clear as possible, not add a whole lot of extra buttons. That's one of the biggest, I think, competitive advantages originally of our company was just really simplifying the methods, not giving you a whole lot of options and putting that extra work into not giving people options, making you know the instrument or the method automatically compensate for those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. That's a, a big area where we can help people is just not have the questions in the first place or just you know not confuse people in the first place. You know, the next step, is really we put a lot of effort into our product videos. It's, you know, it's not something where we just toss it over to the marketing team and let them make Mm -hmm. a video. It's something where myself, our engineering and our research development team, and our sales team all collaboratively work on the scripts through multiple edits to make sure those videos are truly what we believe is the absolute best practice for how to accomplish a given test or to use a given product. And But, of course, that only goes so far because there's going to be uh, site-specific issues or questions that we didn't anticipate and that sort of thing. So, of course, having a constant line of communication is critical. The other part is that we try and make sure we are always available to the customer. And one of the big things is just having a, an easy email or phone relationship. Email You know, we make sure we turn that around very quickly. And phone, we make sure that, you know, there's no automated processes. There's no, uh, you know, auto attendant or anything like that, that a live technician picks up the phone with at least one transfer. And that, I think, really is valued by customers. Of course, that only works for this time zone in this part of the world. So a big part of what we do is communicate with our distributors, hold regular trainings so that they can do that where we can't in languages that we don't speak, that sort of thing. Oh, and finally, I, you know, I also put a lot of effort into every year, AMP gives me the opportunity to talk to their training team, talk to the mm-hmm. trainers who are teaching the courses. And so what I have the great opportunity to do is to present on one subject where I feel that maybe there are some changes in the industry or some changes in the best practice and really work with those trainers specifically to go through a given product, given procedure, and show them, hey, here's exactly where the problem is and where you can improve how you teach or teach this slightly modified method to give a better outcome for students. And every AMP trainer has my card and is able to call me or our team at any point. And that, of course, applies to contractors I meet or anything. We are always trying to be very available to people. So you've mentioned AMP a few times, both with regards to training, as you were just describing, also events. What is your history with AMP, and I suppose before it, NACE and or SSPC prior to the 2021 merger? What's your history with the associations, and how has it helped you over the years? Now we're spending it to, I suppose, our true member profile here, because we want to spotlight important people within the association, such as yourself. I know you've been a member in some form or capacity for nearly a decade now. Just talk, if you could, about the ways in which the associations, both AMP and those preceding it, have helped you and your company over the years. Yeah, the associations have been incredibly important to our company. I really see it in in 
you know, in, in a great way as a partnership in a lot of ways, because, you know, it starts at the, the trainings where in the CIP courses and many other of the AMP and previously SSPC and NACE programs, the, the trainings involve our equipment and, of course, the equipment of our competitors, but they really teach our customers how to use equipment properly. And in doing so and in uh, having equipment used properly, I find really work to grow the industry for testing because I think when testing is done well, it's a very easy sell and something that's very easy to justify. When testing is unclear, when it's not performed properly, or when there's multiple different competing standards or practices, I think there's a lot of skepticism that grows. And ultimately, that hurts everybody, hurts the entire industry. And that's why the industry, you know, including my competitors, will all work together to really try and support these training programs. And the same logic applies to standards. We are active participant in the creation of the uh, test and measurement standards, both through AMP and bodies like ASTM and mm-hmm. ISO. And it's it's really the same idea as for the trainings, but it's about making sure the specifications and the procedures that are trained, uh, that we ultimately train on, mm-hmm. are clear, are correct, are using best practices, and are universal so that it's not very specific to one person's you know, one company's instruments it's not specific to one state or locale that these are truly international and you know, universally accepted beyond that the research side is of of uh, amp and the previous corpor- uh, previous organizations is uh, really matters a lot because that's how these technologies develop. It's, you know, it's, it's not uncommon at all that when we're designing a new product and we constantly are doing that, that we're looking at old AMP, NACE, SSPC conference papers that really started bringing forward a lot of the concepts that suddenly we're seeing a need to measure. I think there's no better example of that than um, some of the early research by Hugh Roper, who's now retired, on the importance of peak density and peak count to uh, coding adhesion and overall coding performance. That really, those papers, although he didn't realize it and we weren't working with him, when we, we saw that research, we started really working hard on an instrument that could measure a lot of those other parameters about our surface profile because we it was pretty clear from that research that it worked. And that wouldn't have happened if there was not a conference that, uh, that, or that really would have enabled those papers to be published and us to find them. So all that together, and then speaking of conferences, the trade shows are absolutely pivotal. We have mm-hmm. been at every NACE and every SSPC show, really, I think, since the inception of those organizations, or at least the modern history of those organizations. It's a great way to keep in touch with uh, critical customers, critical partners in the industry, and develop new partnerships and customer uh, customer relationships. You know, the, the advertising mm-hmm. space is not as it was maybe – 20, 30 years ago, where it was very easy to get in touch with customers because everybody read one single magazine or something like that. Mm-hmm. Now it's the Wild West of Google AdWords. There's, you know, all these different ways. And ultimately, I think people suffer from a bit of information overload and a clear, simple direction from publications such as Codings Pro and organizations such as AMP is actually more valuable, even though I'm sure a lot of people at the dawn of these technologies really would have counted those publications and organizations out. I think it became quite the opposite. And so really it's been an honor, uh, I guess, starting beginning of July to be joining the AMP board and to be really furthering all those efforts and being able to try to support them and keep them strong at a sort of a both grassroots and oversight level, I guess. Yeah, what do you think about how things are going with the combined organization. Obviously, when you got started, it was NACE and SFCC. Now it's AMP. I should have mentioned off the top that you're now on the AMP board as well, in addition to the Codings Pro Editorial Advisory Group. What do you think as far as combining the two legacy groups? How is it going? What are the strengths? Are there any weaknesses? Are there things we need to do better? Just talk about how this is going, and I suppose your excitement level or what you're able to do under one umbrella as AMP moving forward. Yeah, and I am really excited about the combination. I think previously each organization had its strengths and it had really great constituencies, but also did struggle uh, just because of their you know, relatively small size. It meant a lot of overhead. Mm-hmm. It meant more limited reach. And I think a singular focus has a lot of potential benefits. I think – 
we maybe, you know, many people, including sometimes ourselves, underappreciated the effort and the challenges associated with combining two organizations that have so many roles and responsibilities. And so it was a lot of work. I've even seen it, you know, today and in, in going participating in several board meetings. There is a lot that still has to be done as far as migrating systems and all that to make everything work together. And it didn't really help to have a pandemic right in the middle of that whole merger. Uh, right. But also it did buy a little bit of time, perhaps, to, to slow down and, and, and really make this work properly. So what I'm seeing and why I'm really exciting, excited to be timing my entry to the board at this juncture is I'm starting to see a lot of those combinations start working and paying off. You know, one thing I watch is the activity with standards. For a little while, the AMP, sta- the AMP standards really was a little bit stagnant. A lot of the previous work with SSPC and NACE had kind of stopped. Everybody was stepping back, just watching to see how things were going. And the standards that you did see get voted upon were just kind of getting through with minimal votes. What I love now, I've been watching 2023, standards are getting a lot of interest. I see a lot going through for ballot. And not just that, I'm seeing a lot of negatives on those ballots, which, you know, nobody likes a negative on their ballot on a standard, but it means that there's a lot of interest and discussion and a lot of stakeholders being present, really understanding and making their thoughts known. And I I think that's kind of a microcosm for what we're seeing AMP overall move in the direction of is is getting those stakeholders back. You know, I think there's some constituencies that we still need to work to get to get back the contractors, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of time. And I think as this organization really grows and, and goes beyond where it was before, I'd say right now we're probably maybe at where we were before the merger. We're back where we were. And I think a lot of the numbers bear that out. Now it's time to grow. And I think we're really well positioned to grow and to keep really uh, good organizational uh, integrity, you know, structurally, accounting wise, and just systems wise to, to really, you know, really take off going forward. I'm excited. Let's talk a bit more niche within the publications of AMP, because as I mentioned leading off the top, you're on the EHE, the editorial advisory group here at Codings Pro. Why is that something you're interested in? You clearly have a lot going on and a lot on your plate at Defelsco, but you go the extra mile to, you know, take on a leadership role within AMP. You've taken on something of a leadership role within Codings Pro by being on the EAG. Just talk, if you could, about the value you see from that and why you think that's a good use of your time. One of the things I first learned when joining this business is that you can have the best product, you can have the best method, you can have the best understanding of a given principle, but it really means nothing if it's not communicated well. And so what the the editorial advisory group, what the publications and AMP, and a lot of what I do, you know, whether it's videos, et cetera, is about communication. You know, we find that it really takes about five years for the industry to often learn about a new product uh, widely, to learn about a change to a test method, et cetera. And my goal, why I do a lot of these initiatives, is to try and reduce that that time lag, to try and get the industry more up to date, faster with best practices, new equipment, and really modern standards for for doing our, our jobs. And you know, there's no better publication and group for that than the uh, the Codings Pro Material Performance Publications and AMP overall. So I participate whenever I can. So what do you see moving forward as some of the challenges that we need to address? And when I ask this question, I'm talking more AMP as a whole. Certainly the publications play into that since these are member magazines and you do want to support the broader mission. But just at an overall association level, when we talk not just about any one company, but looking at corrosion control, protective coatings as a whole, what are some of the key challenges that you see coming down the pike over the next five to ten years? And what are some of the ways or, or strategies that we can adopt to potentially work together? What, what are the areas that I, I guess a better way to ask the question, look, there's some things that are going to need to be handled on a person by person or company by 
company basis. But then there's also other issues where you can really benefit from getting everyone on the same page and working collaboratively as one to try and address those problems. So from that standpoint, what are some of the things at an industry-wide level that you see coming down the pike over the next decade, some of those challenges that hopefully as one AMP we can potentially address? I think the biggest challenges we see are with respect to innovation and sustainability. And what I mean by that is that both, you know, of course, companies, instrumentation, paint companies, et cetera, everybody's working to innovate to make their product better. But we're also dealing with the the ramifications of what our products, uh, you know, do to the world. And so I have to work with sustainability in mind. And sometimes that innovation isn't necessarily just to make an existing product work better, but to be more sustainable. And the challenges that brings is that a lot of things are changing and changing quickly because it's not just because you get a little bit of extra life. It's because there might be a regulatory or otherwise, you know, a, a specification need that means suddenly you need to make a change very quickly or you're not going to be able to use a given product or procedure. And so, you know, as we see low VOC products, that sort of thing, you know, that, that's oh, we're really done at this point, uh, it seems to me, and that those regulations have passed, et cetera. But that meant a whole new set of requirements and challenges for coating life, uh, surface preparation. I think that's why it got so much focus is because these newer coatings, these more sustainable coatings, aren't as uh, resistant to poor preparation and poor application. And so where AMP really helps the industry come together is in quickly updating standards, really acting as a hub for research in improving the the state of the art to try and account for that. I think another area where the industry, you know, is challenged is in working in a you know, in the same direction globally, especially as many of the coatings that we rely on aren't necessarily being applied here as as other parts of the world start expecting the quality levels and the procedures that we've relied on for decades. It's about disseminating, disseminating that knowledge to people who don't necessarily speak the same language, who aren't necessarily at work even for an hour at the same time we're at work here. And keeping, you know, managing AMP's expansion in in the global south, the global east, et cetera, uh, to really be the force that does what it does so well for many regions that are more established around the world in those emerging regions as well. And that's that's mm-hmm. not easy to do. That means creating new contacts. That means working with, you know, very new organizations and people to suddenly put something together like training standards, mm-hmm. et cetera. It's not easy. So we've been talking about things that can be led at an AMP leadership level, talking with industry veterans such as yourself that are in influential positions within their company and thus in a good position to lead within the association if they so choose. Let's go to the other stream. Let's talk about people that are brand new to the industry, first starting to go to AMP events, be it annual conference or one of the regional events, or maybe just getting started on some of their certifications and education resources that are available within the association. What advice would you have for them, for somebody that's just getting started in this association world, for somebody that's just starting their career, for somebody who's just starting the same way you were a decade ago, uh, what types of opportunities as far as AMP or career development should they try to take advantage of? One of the things I enjoy most about participating in an AMP and going to conferences is that as we bring on new members of our sales team and marketing teams, we'll often bring those new entrants to this industry with us to the AMP conferences and really try and have them embrace the industry organization just because it, it, we believe in it that much. And my advice to them and anybody just getting started with AMP is to just put yourself out there and try. Just talk to whomever. This is, you know, it's a, there are a lot of people with uh, many, uh, you know, letters after their name and qualifications and incredible reputations. But so many, almost to a person, everybody in this industry is very welcoming, pleasant, nice, and loves to talk about their, you know, what they do. And so I always encourage my my team, you know, just get out there, ask questions, talk, and participate. 
join, you know, go, go to a paper, you know, even though it might not really be, you know, you might not understand what it's about or, you know, who the presenters are, just go and learn, maybe ask questions, talk to the presenter afterwards. You know, this is one of the reasons why I love this industry so much is because it has really great people in it. It has nice people. It has respectful people. I've honestly never had a negative social interaction with anybody at a conference. It's always Same. been pleasant, even with my competitors, even with people we fiercely compete with all around the world. It's always collegial and friendly and uh, just Don't be afraid to put yourself out there, get, you know, get there in person, travel, talk, visit all the booths, go to the papers. And I think it becomes pretty addictive and and very compelling very quickly. Absolutely. Folks, that is Mike Beamish, Vice President and General Manager of DeFelsco. Mike, before we let you go, for listeners that want to potentially get in touch with you or DeFelsco or just learn more, what's the best way they can do that? I'm assuming it's the website, but feel free to toss out whatever contact information that you would like to throw out there for our audience. Yeah, our website has lots of great information, videos, etc. That's uh, defelsco.com. Of course, feel free to give us a call if you have any questions about general industry matters or, you know, specific to our product. Our 1-800 number is uh, 1-800-448-3835. That'll work in North America. Of course, feel free to drop me an email. I'm at uh, mbeamish at defelsco.com. I know that spelling is not trivial, but it might appear in uh, in print or something like that. But uh, we're very much an open book here, and we always like to keep contact with anybody in industry. So, yeah, reach out. Sounds good. Folks, he is Michael Beamish, GM and Vice President of DeFalsco. This is where we will wrap it for today's episode. If you want more from me, Ben DuBose, or our magazine, Codings Pro, that is, the best way to get it is online at codingspromag.com, and you can go to amp.org for resources from the association, the Association for Materials Protection and Performance, that is, again, amp.org for all the AMP resources and codingspromag.com for all the Codings Pro resources. And Mike, of course, is in a leadership position in both organizations. He's on the editorial advisory group at Codings Pro, and he's now on the AMP board starting in July. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Ben. It was a pleasure. And that will do it for today. Again, for Mike, I'm Ben. Thanks, as always, for listening, and please come back soon for another new Codings Pro podcast.